Hi, everyone. Welcome and happy Friday. Thank you so much for joining Myotonic today for the second in our series of Friday afternoon webinars. I'm Dr. Tanya Stevenson, the CEO of Myotonic. I hope you are all well and healthy and managing the isolation, shelter in place, and social distancing practices as best as possible. I know it's often difficult, but when we all do our part, we help to keep our community healthy and get our economy back on track as early as safely possible. I am especially interested in today's presentation as I've been asked many times since I joined the myotonic team exactly how many people are thought to have myotonic dystrophy in the United States, how that number is determined, and what it means with respect to research and acceleration towards treatment. Dr. Nicholas Johnson, now at the Virginia Commonwealth University and his colleagues at the University of Utah, sought to answer these questions, which we will learn more about today. And I'm excited to announce that they're submitting their first article for publication this month. I have the very good fortune of introducing today's speaker, but before I do that, I wanted to share a few reminders. The Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, which is known now as Myotonic, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 2007 by families with myotonic dystrophy seeking support and a cure. Our mission, Care and a Cure, is to enhance the quality of life of people living with myotonic dystrophy and accelerate research focused on finding treatments and a cure. Our work focuses primarily on support and education, research, and advocacy. Just a quick reminder about some of the resources and support group opportunities that are available. We have toolkits and different publications and guidelines on our website at our toolkits and publications page. We've increased the number of virtual support groups and Facebook chats that are available. The calendar of activities is up to date with our Friday afternoon webinar series and all of the support groups that are available right now. And of course, our digital academy, which includes presentations and videos from past conferences and events, is available anytime. And today's presentation will also be posted there when we are done sometime in the afternoon. So I want to invite everyone to join us every Friday at 12 o'clock Pacific Daylight Time for the Friday afternoon webinar series. We have some fantastic speakers and really great topics that are going to be focused on a diverse number of issues. You can go to myotonic.org Friday, sorry, myotonic.org slash Friday dash afternoon dash webinar dash series. A quick plug for next Friday, May 1st at 12 o'clock, nutrition and food preparation for the myotonic dystrophy community. The webinar will cover a basic understanding of adult nutrition, dysphagia, and food preparation. Dr. Leslie Krongold, who is adult onset DM1, and her partner, Jessica, will demonstrate the tools needed to prepare three simple nutritious meals for people with chewing and or swallowing difficulties. So for today's webinar, we are looking at how common myotonic dystrophy may be in the United States. And we are gonna discuss findings from the recent prevalence study. Today's speaker from Virginia Commonwealth University is Dr. Nicholas Johnson. And if you do have questions of the speaker, please type the questions in the chat box of the GoToWebinar and time permitting, we will ask those questions of our speaker at the end. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Nicholas Johnson. He treats adults and children with both common and rare neuromuscular conditions, yet his work doesn't end in the clinic. He dedicates significant time each week to laboratory research and is part of a team at Virginia Commonwealth Health working to advance the treatment of genetic muscle disorders with a special emphasis on muscular dystrophies. Dr. Johnson is board certified in neurology, neuromuscular medicine, and neuromuscular pathology by the American Academy of Neurology and serves on its government relations committee. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Johnson. We'll let you take it from here. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, and I'm happy to talk about our uh, recent study, um, um, which seeks to understand how common myotonic dystrophy is in the United States, which uh, was, was the intent of our prevalence study. 
uh, and um, as, as was said, I'm uh, at Virginia Commonwealth University now. These are my disclosures. So the goal of the study is, is uh, deceptively simple. It's uh, how common is myotonic dystrophy type 1? Um, in other words, what's the prevalence of myotonic dystrophy type 1? That would be the, the term that we use to, to talk about it. And it's worth um, going through some of the um, some of the differences in how people think about prevalence versus incidence um, as we think about this study. So prevalence is defined as counting the existing disease diagnoses at a single point in time, and incidence counts new disease diagnoses during a time period. So incidence can th be thought of the as the new circles coming into this uh, funnel. Um, that you know, as they add in those, that's the instance. Those three. The prevalence is thought of as really just how many circles are in this uh, funnel here, um, and so that's a good way of uh, comparing, contrasting, contrasting it. This study, which did use a newborn uh, blood spot um, population, is really thought of as a cohort study, and so in other words, it's really designed to count the prevalence of myotonic dysphagia type one, since we didn't model uh, the cases coming in or, or leaving. So what was known about the prevalence or how common myotonic dystrophy was uh, prior to the study? So one of the real challenges is that these prior uh, epidemiological studies focus on uh, individuals who are diagnosed. But on average, it takes about seven years to make a DM1 diagnosis. Um, and you can see that these, um, these different um, studies from the United Kingdom, Serbia, Israel, Italy, Ireland, United Kingdom, all came up with really different numbers about what the true uh, prevalence would be. And I think most people in the, most researchers and others in the community had really used the, used the kind of shorthand in thinking that myotonic dystrophy was thought to be about one in every 8,000 people had the disease. But our suspicion was that, in fact, undiagnosed individuals may look, may look these prevalence estimates look low. That's important for um, a couple of reasons we'll circle back to at the end when we talk about takeaways. One key reason is, of course, that you know there's people out there in the community that are have this um, serious and life-threatening condition, don't know that they have it, don't know that their families have it. Um, it's concerning uh, from a research funding standpoint and also from a drug development standpoint. We'll come back to that at the end. So why, why the diagnostic delay? Um, really, you know, there's lots of different reasons. I don't have the uh, definitive reason, but here's some things that people talk about when we think about why does it really take seven years? Uh, well, there's multiple symptoms at the onset. As many of you know, some people really have a lot of cognitive concerns at the beginning, or it could be as simple as the cataracts, could be the muscle weakness or the myotonia as the presenting symptoms. So what that means is that they may see many different types of physicians for these initial symptoms, some uh, more or less um, um, familiar and savvy with the diagnosis of myotonic dystrophy type 1, and that can really um, lead to um, um, some of the challenges in terms of the delay. Um, and this um, estimate about the seven-year delay was uh, taken from a paper uh, by Jim uh, Hilbert and Dick Moxley at the University of Rochester which really looked uh, in their registry about how long it took for people to achieve an accurate diagnosis. All right, so let's transition into a little bit about uh, some of the technical things that we'll be talking about today. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about CTG repeats. Um, as, mo as I'm sure many of you on the call know, uh, CTG repeat causes uh, myotonic dystrophy type one. Uh, you can see here, this is a picture of the gene. Here's this DMPK gene, dystrophia myotonia protein kinase. And out here in this non-coding region, um, so it's not part of the, the protein, but rather it's at the tail end of the gene, there's a series of repeats. So these are the CTG repeats or CUG repeats if you're talking about DNA versus RNA. And uh, normally those repeats are, are between five and 37. So there's five CTGs in a row up to 37. There is this pre-mutation uh, range, uh, which is uh, you know, not thought to be disease causing uh, and asymptomatic between uh, 38 and 49 repeats. 
in that we know that uh, uh, people who have greater than 50 repeats uh, have a, a myotonic dystrophy type 1 phenotype. And so the size of the repeat, which we'll talk about in a few slides, um, likely um, is related to the overall disease severity. But that's important, an important kind of uh, baseline information because we're going to talk a lot about repeats and repeat links. So what do those repeats do? I think it's worth um, just making sure that we're all on the same page about the disease pathogenesis. So uh, those repeats, um, as they get longer, form these hairpin loops and get sticky in the middle of cells. And as they get sticky, they, um, they bind really important RNA splicing proteins called the muscle blind proteins and others. Um, and those proteins uh, would normally um, make other proteins into the right shape. So they, they're in charge of a process called RNA splicing. And this is a pictorial uh, example of that. So you have, for example, the chloride channel um, uh, pre-mRNA here. And normally what would happen is muscle blind would come here and cut out exon 7A. And you'd have a normal uh, chloride channel that would be formed going from six to seven. But that sequestered by the um, CUG repeat, um, you're not able to um, make that cut the way it should be. And because um, the, the pre-mRNA is not spliced appropriately, um, patients have a, a deficient uh, chloride channel and then end up with uh, myotonia. And there's lots of other examples about uh, why that might happen. Uh, and then one final uh, piece in terms of the introduction, which is that the repeat length is associated with severity. Um, very, very broadly speaking. So these are, um, you know, very rough estimates uh, and the association is certainly rough as well. Uh, for example, if you have 155 repeats or 145, probably not that big of a difference. Um, but, you know, in broad general generalities, people think about um, those individuals with repeats between 50 and 150 is often having uh, what can be called either mild or late onset, or sometimes it's called oligosymptomatic. Uh, and, and these patients often have age of onset after the age of 50, uh, typically have early cataracts and some mild weakness. And it's, it's the mildest, um, you tend to be the mildest patients on the spectrum of myotonic dystrophy. Those patients with repeat lengths between 150 up until 1,000, often have a typical or adult onset myotonic dystrophy. So onset typically in teens or, or anytime up to 50 or, or even later with early cataracts, um, weakness in the hands and feet, and then that myotonia or delayed muscle relaxation. Childhood onset, as you can see that the repeat length is getting up higher now above 600 or to 1200 or so. Onset you know, before the age of 10, but not at birth. Um, often with intellectual impairment and uh, stomach upset, um, diarrhea and constipation um, and things like that. And then congenital onset, um, these patients have the longest uh, repeat lengths um, or associated with the longest repeat lengths and the onset at birth with, um, with uh, floppy babies, uh, breathing problems and feeding problems. So again, very rough generalizations about um, the window of their CTG repeat lengths and there's an, you can see there's an awful lot of overlap um, between these different, uh, in terms of the overall spectrum, but it is uh, known that that CTG repeat length is um, associated with um, different um, ages of onset and, and overall disease severity, roughly. So with all that said, what is the prevalence of myotonic dystrophy? How common is it? So our goal is to count how many people in a large co cohort have that repeat expansion so again, so here you can see, we're not counting how many people have symptoms, we're counting how many people have that repeat expansion, because we know at some point in life, um, if people live long enough with that repeat expansion, they're gonna have symptoms associated with myotonic dystrophy. So we needed to screen as many people uh, as possible in a controlled population. So the easiest way to do um, a prevalence study is to have 100 people stand in the room, and count how many people have blonde hair in that in that group. Um, if you have people coming into the room or leaving the room, uh, as many of you, have, anybody who's been in a, in a place where they've had to try and count um, count hands or count faces, you recognize that that becomes harder. So you really need a controlled population. One of the other major challenges 
in myotonic dystrophy is that because that repeat length can be really long, um, typically people had measured it using uh, what's called a southern blot. And that southern blot um, on a single patient can take you know four to five days to process. Very cumbersome, very hard to do um, a lot of it in, in the same day. So um, here's the approach that uh, we used. Um, so we took uh, 50,382 newborn blood spots um, to screen for myotonic dystrophy type 1. Um, and we used a technique um, called a melt screen um, that allows us um, to screen uh, tests uh, very quickly. And I'll, you'll see some examples of what that actually looks like in a few slides here. But essentially, this is a PCR, so it's a lot cheaper. It's a lot faster than doing a southern blot. And again, we can look and see um, what the uh, quote uh, melt curve looked like on different um, repeat sizes. And then we would follow, follow that with confirmatory testing. So the samples were received from consecutive live births in New York State. Um, and then we performed that uh, triplet prime PCR with uh, positive and negative controls. So in other words, every time we did the test, we made sure that there were some, some samples in there that we knew had a repeat expansion and some samples in there that we knew didn't have the repeat expansion so that if the if, it, if the plate worked or didn't work, we'd be able to tell appropriately. And then four blinded reviewers um, evaluated each melt curve and called it either positive, negative, or indeterminate. Uh, and based on that, uh, confirmatory testing uh, was pursued with positive calls or premutations or any mixed review. So if one person disagreed with the rest of the group, and so if three called it negative and one called it positive, that still went for confirmatory testing. And that confirmatory testing um, used something called the Assurgan Amplidex PCR on a capillary run. And I'll show an example of what that looked like. So these are these melt curves. Um, so you can see, uh, normally speaking, um, that if uh, with a certain number of CTT repeats, so here's a good example, um, these two down at the end, you can see that um, uh, in four and five, um, the black tracing line here um, that as that sample um, gets heated up, um, that the DNA unwinds. And so the, that hairpin loop that I showed a few slides back um, straightens out. And as it straightens out, um, you, can, you can measure how quickly um, that fluorescence dye comes back down to zero uh, with the temperature. Uh, and this is the cutoff right here at uh, 90 degrees or 88 degrees Celsius. Um, and so, uh, like I said, uh, with 12 repeats, that comes down uh, very quickly in, in um, five in the far uh, right-hand panel. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, the repeats get higher. And uh, even at 31 repeats, which is normal, the, the curve comes back down to normal before the cutoff, but just barely. Sometimes the testing test doesn't work, uh, or it's a mixed test that's indeterminate. 37 repeats would be one of those premutations, and you can see that it just barely doesn't come back to normal um, at uh, 90 degrees there. And then here's 100 repeats, and you can see that black tracing line out here in our, on the far left panel uh, that those um, that that the um, the black line stays uh, elevated; uh, it doesn't go back um, down. And so. This is what we're looking for. This is what those uh, blinded reviewers were looking at uh, when they looked at these different melt curves and to classify them as either positive, premutations, or um, negative. Uh, and this is an example of that uh, capillary technology. Uh, here you can see that there's this uh, big uh, or peak here uh, with the repeat length and that that can provide a size. Um, and so it's a just a um, a solid check on whether or not that melt curve uh, found what it was supposed to find. Um, and uh, of course, you can size everything um, all the way down to five repeats. The, the trick with this particular technology um, is that if the repeat length was above 200, it was not able to demonstrate an accurate size. Um, and so um, all of those um, samples that ended up being positive that were over 200 repeats uh, we did not, uh, weren't able to tell you what the size is besides the fact that say that it's over 200 repeats. Um, and, you know, this was a, um, a methodological um, change that we made 
um, because the amount of DNA that we got from those uh, heel sticks was quite small um, and insufficient for us to be able to use the more traditional southern blot technology that we would have liked to use. So this is a summary of what the blood, what the uh, workflow is. So the blood spot was received, the DNA was extracted, uh, the melt curve was uh, re was reviewed by those four blinded reviewers. If it was negative, uh, the final count was collated. If it was positive, you did the confirmatory test, and then that went into the final count. And this is these are the results. This the take home slide of the uh, present uh, presentation. So there were out of that uh, 50,000 or so and change, there were 25 positive, which is um, those uh, greater than 50, and that there were 91, um, so just about triple the amount of people that have a premutation. And then uh, between 30 and 34, which you would call high normal, the another 201 um, or so people, and then of course normal is the rest of them. And this is a graph showing the breakdown of what the uh, confirmed results were in terms of those positive uh, DM1 samples. Uh, and there's a couple things to say here. So, so the first thing is if you draw a line right about 150 or so, you'll notice that just about half the samples um, were below 150 repeats. Uh, and that probably uh, is an important take home point that we'll discuss it, uh, in a little bit but that half were over that 150 repeat size. Uh, and, but they, there's certainly a wide range uh, in terms of the overall repeat length um, going all the way down to just over 50, uh, you know, and then of course, well over 200. So where were these patients coming from? Where were these samples coming from? Um, you know, just like Ancestry.com, um, we can uh, use, um, uh, what's called single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, within those DNA samples to see, um, you know, what what their ethnicity um, or race would be, uh, and you can see uh, out of those positive samples uh, that many of them uh, were from Europe. Um, so uh, this the graph on the left shows um, the ancestry estimation using the genotype data um, across the principal components. Uh, and then on the right, you can see uh, for the individual numbers, so the CTG repeat length there, you can see the CTG repeat length uh, and then the uh, column about, generally speaking, um, where, um, where that uh, particular um, person would have, um, what their background ethnicity would be. So I don't think it's very surprising to us that um, uh, many people were from um, Europe, um, I think, you know, that's, that's fairly consistent with what we see uh, in practice or European ancestry. But you can also see uh, there's a mix of um, other people that uh, from either uh, Middle Eastern backgrounds, um, Asian backgrounds, um, and then even um, a single um, that would be, you know, essentially uh, Native American or uh, Alaskan Native. Uh, there were no um, positive samples from uh, either Oceania or Africa in this uh, data set. So that's pretty consistent with what you might expect to see in the state of New York. Um, so uh, New York State, uh, birth by race in 2014, which is the year that these samples were taken from, uh, 238,000 births. So uh, we're, you know, roughly, uh, you know, a bit under a quarter of those births uh, were total were sampled. Uh, and it is a, a predominantly Caucasian uh, population, but there's a fair amount uh, of Black or African American, about 20%, and then you know a small percentage in terms of American Indian or Alaska Native, and, and um, about 11% or so of Asian. So um, this is um, our samples that were positive were uh, fairly representative of what you might see just in general across the births from the state of New York. Uh, and it does, it is consistent with prior studies which have suggested that myotonic dystrophy uh, type 1 is less common in African populations, uh, which has been shown uh, well back into the 1990s um, by the group from um, Harvard. So the uh, conclusion here is that uh, the current myotonic dystrophy type 1 prevalence is about 1 in uh, uh, 2000 or 1 in 2016, if you want to be precise. Uh, from the numbers, but really just exactly, almost exactly at one in uh, 2,000, uh, or, or about five for every 10,000 uh, individuals. But there's about triple the number of uh, premutations. 
and uh, approximately 50% of identified individuals had less than 150 repeats. So here's, a, here's some of the takeaways from the study. Uh, so the first takeaway is that rapid testing is possible. So this study demonstrates or provides a foundation that you can cheaply and rapidly screen for myotonic dystrophy type 1. Uh, using that melt, uh, melt screen, I don't think anybody would say that that melt screen should be taken as the definitive test, but it's a lot faster than any other method that's available, and it's fairly inexpensive. Uh, it had good uh, test retest reliability and predictive value. And so, you know, I think that's a that's an important point to be made that, you know, that rapid testing for, for the uh, CTG repeat is, is possible. This was a prior issue um, with next generation sequencing panels. So um, if anybody been following the news from the MDA and um, other uh, patient advocacy groups uh, in terms of sequencing for, for example, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy or limb girdle muscular dystrophy, they can use uh, next generation panels uh, very inexpensively. One of the issues with myotonic dystrophy type one is that that southern bot is actually fairly expensive to um, to perform, and so this this definitely overcomes that hurdle. Um, there is, you know, as a kind of caveat to that, there is limited ability to assess for repeat sizing, um, as I think we, we you, you were able to see there that we really, if it's above 200 repeats, it's hard to uh, perform that assessment using this particular methodology. Here's takeaway number two: uh, premutations are relatively common, uh, at least double or you know close to triple. Uh, of true mut mutations. Now, what does that mean? Good question. That's a really good question. I don't know what that means. Um, I think um, it is unclear um, using the current uh, body of uh, research that's available to us in the community and to you. Uh, what is the risk of a premutation? You know, what's the, what's the rate of expansion for that person? Do they ever uh, start as a premutation and and then become a mutation that's hasn't been reported uh, to date? Um, if they have a premutation, does that mean that the next generation is uh, by definition going to have uh, a, a full length mutation, so something over 50 repeats? I think that's that information is not available to us. So there's an awful lot of unknown questions here about um, what is required to understand the true rate of expansion. What this does do is in a large population, give the first, first uh, instance of how frequent these premutations occur, which is probably uh, as important as anything else uh, to begin to, to start to tackle that question. For example, if you knew that there was about triple the amount of premutations out there, um, if I think about you know, what the overall population of myotonic dystrophy type, type 1 is, it's hard for me to believe that there, every generation those, um, those repeats are expanding. Um, because otherwise there'd be a lot more people out there with myotonic dystrophy type 1. And so I think, um, you know, it's possible that these are you know, potentially slightly more stable than what had been previously thought. But that's speculation on my part. I think um, this is an area where there's an awful lot of more research that needs to be done uh, to start to give us a, a handle on what this really means uh, and what we should be telling people where they, do, where they are uh, finding premutations. So the short answer, premutations are relatively common. What does that mean? We don't really know. Uh, takeaway number three, um, half of myotonic dystrophy type one patients have repeats less than 150. Yeah, I have to say for myself in clinic, um, I do see a fair number of people who have repeats less than 150. Uh, and it's not uncommon for me to, um, to sit there across from, from somebody who has that and, and we can talk about very mild symptoms uh, and to be honest, um, in a lot of cases, if I had seen that person out on the street or had seen them for the first time, I wouldn't have necessar necessarily um, known that they had myotonic dystrophy type 1 until I did the genetic testing. Um, these may be clinically undetectable in a lot of instances. And in fact, um, many, many, many of the people that I see with repeats less than 150 they're coming to clinic because their grandchild was diagnosed with myotonic dystrophy type 1 or their child was diagnosed with myotonic dystrophy type 1. So um, they still have a 50-50 chance of passing the disease on to the next generation. Um, and in fact, uh, because of anticipation, um, there's um, a, a good chance that when that repeat gets passed on to the next generation, 
it's longer than 150. Um, it may be in the congenital onset range or a childhood onset range or an adult onset range. Um, so it's very common to have um, that repeat uh, in, in somebody, in a grandparent or a grandmother or even a mother or father, uh, a repeat of say 75 and then in the next generation it's up to 400 or even up to 1,000. So um, uh, these people um, are likely, would present with late onset or mild disease. Um, they are often clinically undetectable. I'm, I'm sure that they're walking around and we just do not um, do not recognize that they have the condition, but you know it's important from a family planning standpoint that they have a 50-50 chance of passing this disease on to the next generation. Um, and um, you know how how to better identify those patients in the future, I think, is another area um, that's ripe for um, additional research for better understanding uh, for a, you know a way to 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 reach them out in the general population. Um, takeaway number four. Uh, Myotoxic tissue type 1 is still a rare disease, if barely. Um, so the current U.S. classification defines a rare disease as having um, people, uh, roughly speaking, it's about uh, uh, fewer than 1 in uh, 2,000. And, uh, you know, that's true. Uh, it's just barely uh, fewer than uh, uh, or, or um, less common than 1 in 2,000. Um, that's an important distinction. Um, and it, it cuts both ways. So there are a number of benefits that are afforded to rare diseases um, because these are, are often understudied, under-recognized, um, um, under, under-resourced in terms of drug development. Um, and so there are specialized funders, uh, funding for researchers like myself at the National Institutes of Health. Um, there's a specific drug approval uh, pathway at the FDA that allows uh, for uh, a quicker um, and easier drug approval process. Uh, and then there's some additional financial assistant uh, components for patients. Um, so, you know, there's lots of benefits to being a rare disease, um, you know, um, and, and certainly that's uh, true uh, for people with myotonic dystrophy um, as well. Um, I would say uh, what one of my hopes, uh, and though I don't know if this is true, but my hope would be to say that, um, that because it's just barely a rare disease, um, you know, I think that sh that should uh, make it even more attractive for, as a target for uh, drug discovery uh, and development, uh, because um, still meets all those benefits to being in the rare disease field. But um, um, conversely, you know, there's lots lots of people um, out there, and so it's it's a little easier than something that has a prevalence of one in uh, hundred thousand uh, to design an appropriate clinical trial. So um, I had a couple of discussion topics um, that I thought might come up um, as a result of, of sharing these uh, data. Um, so newborn screening. So I, I told you um, that we figured out how to, how to screen for the repeat um, um, quickly and, and, and cheaply. Um, and that I also, I also told you that um, we have a very hard time finding people with a repeat length less than 150. And I think uh, many of you in the room uh, or in the at home on your computers would have maybe thought, huh, I wonder if we should be doing new board screening. Well, we certainly um, wonder that too, um, of, source, of course, and, and uh, the study definitely provides uh, the methodology, the framework, the roadmap um, uh, to pursue newborn screening, for example. Um, but we probably don't quite have the criteria um, um, that the either the federal government or state governments uh, in charge of supporting newborn screening would, would promote in terms of, um, you know, how to uh, approve this. And, and the main issue, in my opinion, um, is that in order for a test to go on to newborn screening, uh, the, the state and the federal government would like, would like us to articulate that, in fact, um, if the diagnosis was made at birth versus at 10, 12, uh, 30 years old, um, that something would be different. Something would be different for that person uh, in such a way that it um, that it would be worth it, uh, worth the time, expense, um, et cetera, um, to uh, find out the answer right at birth. And so they, the uh, parlance there, or the, the criteria that most people have thought about is uh, disease-modifying therapies. And so as it stands right now in myotonic dystrophy, we don't have disease-modifying therapies. Um, there is an awful lot of work going on um, 
all across uh, the United States and Europe and other places um, looking at developing those disease modifying therapies. And so I think this is something that we will continue to come back to in the future. Um, is it ready right now to be talking uh, about newborn screening? I'm not sure. Um, but I think this study certainly provides a foundation uh, for how you might think about it. Um, it provides some of the basic uh, prevalence uh, criteria, it even uh, in some ways uh, serves as a pilot of newborn screening, uh, but it doesn't, uh, you know, whether or not the state government would see it that way in terms of uh, the utility of it um, moving forward is, I think, a different question. Okay. So um, in terms of discussion topics, future research and pre prevalence, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done in terms of understanding the rate of premutation expansion. Um, I think additional work should be needs to be done in terms of confirming the study in clinical populations. Keeping in mind that this study was done really uh, in um, in uh, a newborn population, and so you know these people will develop um, um, the disease at some point. But um, you know we don't know when, and we don't know how severe, and we don't know the relationship to that repeat length that was identified. So one way of, of dealing with that is to, now that we understand that we think the prevalence is probably about one in 2000, you can go back to a, a clinical population or a group of people, um, you know, 2000 people standing around and, and see how many have it. You would expect one at least to have it. Um, and then you, I think there's probably a point to be made about um, thinking about clinical trial design uh, in mild um, or late onset populations. Um, I, I told you just about half half the people have a repeat length between 50 and 150. And so, um, you know, what does that mean? Do those people still need um, early uh, therapies? Um, how would you measure success in that population uh, in terms of some of the disease modifying therapies that are be that are being are being thought of? Um, I think these are these are questions. I'm not sure that I have the answer for any of these three questions, but. Um, certainly areas that are ripe for additional uh, research. Um, I don't want to leave this off, uh, and I hope that I can come back and share these results at some point. Um, uh, we are and have undertaken a very similar approach uh, to myotonic dystrophy type 2. It's, it's, again, you can see using those melt curves with the capillary runs, the exact same process, exact, exact same uh, sample um, cohort. Um, and so that work is definitely uh, under uh, progress. About 9,000 or so have been scored, um, and uh, one, one sample so far has been uh, truly positive. But, um, you know, really um, lots more work to be done in this particular um, side of it, and um, um, just to acknowledge the fact that that's, that's underway, and we hope we can come back and share those results in the near future. Um, uh, lots of people um, um, helped and participated in this um, project. A special thanks to Denise Kay at New York State, um, who really um, um, helped us um, uh, specifically with obtaining those blood spots. Um, Russ Butterfield and um, Robert Weiss, uh, in terms of developing the, the methodology. Uh, Marsha Feldkamp was the epidemiologist in that um, project. Uh, Diane, Karina, and Brett, and other uh, for really doing a lot of the, the hard work in terms of uh, screening and checking those samples and, and scoring them. And of course, uh, this this couldn't have been done with the my, without the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation or Myotonic uh, providing the financial support to to reform the um, uh, technique and, and the project. With that, I'll I'll pause and um, uh, take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. We do have a few questions that have come in. Um, a couple of them have to do with race or ethnicity. One is, why do you think so many people of European ancestry have myotonic dystrophy compared to others? And I, I think a follow-up to that is, um, the Latinx population was absent from the presentation. So I'm wondering if the disease is prevalent among that population at all. Um, so uh, there are two questions in there. I think um, it's um, thought, and this was work done by uh, Dr. Brooks uh, and, the, and the group at Harvard in the early 90s that 
the original repeat expansion uh, um, arose um, after one of the first migrations out of Africa in terms of evolutionary ancestry. And so um, that is thought to be the reason uh, or one of the primary reasons for why uh, myotonic dystrophy is uh, less common in African populations, certainly not absent. Um, I, I myself have some patients uh, who are African American have myotonic dystrophy, but uh, significantly less common in African um, uh, descendants. Um, the um, the data um, that we had uh, in terms of um, um, uh, birth uh, data um, uh, from New York State was not not available uh, right then, so we don't don't have that. But there's um, there's reason to believe that, uh, for example, the um, you know uh, particularly Spanish ancestry would kind of group within um, within European, and so it was it's a bit mixed in the European population. So um, not necessarily less common in the uh, Latino population, but um, um, I think you have to dig a little bit deeper for that particular uh, component or that part. Okay, Dr. Thank Johnson, um, one question that came in from our audience is, how generalizable is this prevalence study to the entire United States population? Yeah, so uh, we think it's very generalizable. Um, I think that um, the, um, um, you know, we used uh, the New York State uh, population number one because they have a, a large number of births, and so um, it's possible to achieve the right sample size, but also because it's a fairly representative um, state. There's, um, you know, a, a mix of every um, uh, uh, racial and ethnic background uh, across those births. And so um, we think that that um, is fairly representative uh, across the entire United States. Thank you. Um, there is another question that's come in. Um, now that we know it is more common than we thought, Will there be other studies on the prevalence of myotonic dystrophy or premutations, and how does that happen? Good question. Um, so I think um, I think um, this study uh, required a, a large number of um, people to participate because our expectation was that actually that the prevalence was going to be lower than what it actually was, um, and so. Um, now that we believe uh, or know that the prevalence is is down at around one in two thousand, it should be able to do addition. Should be possible to do additional prevalence studies uh, with a smaller number of people. So I think, and I hope um, that um, in a clinical population. So for example, um, you know, you could take maybe um, people that come into um, your uh, or into my clinic uh, and and see how many of them have it. Um, or take a um, you know a college uh, population and see again um, uh, how many have it. One of the challenges with doing the study that way is that you necessarily exclude some people. So, for example, if you're um, somebody out there who had 60 repeats, you don't have any children, and you don't know you have it, then you're certainly not coming into my neuromuscular clinic. Um, and um, you know if we if you choose a college population, for example. Um, then, um, then you know, you may uh, bias yourself against, you know, people who weren't able to go to college for one reason or another. So I think um, there's lots of challenges with doing that clinical um, study, which is why we undertook this in such a way uh, in a really unbiased sample, just a general population sample. But I would uh, think and hope that there would be additional questions we want to ask about where we think these people who are currently undiagnosed are. Um, or if they do have any symptoms. I think in terms of the, um, uh, thinking about those people who have um, uh, premutations, um, there's a lot more work that needs to go into this. Um, and that is, those studies I think will be difficult, but I suspect um, we will transition away from humans and into either mouse models or cell, cell models um, so that we can really understand the stability of that premutation. Um, and what might trigger, which is important for us to know, what might trigger that repeat to to expand, uh, and what you know, what's the background genetic context that 
that triggers that repeat to expand. These are these are good and open questions, uh, but I think uh, for that, those questions, I suspect we'll go back to model systems because it's really difficult to study three, four, or five generations, um, you know, over time. Okay, there's a, a couple more questions. One is, where can I find the results of your study that can be shared? How can I let our doctors know that this is so common? They don't believe me when I tell them it's more common than they think. Yep, so that's um, that's certainly our responsibility to you. Uh, and um, as uh, Tanya said at the outset, the uh, the manuscripts or the publications that uh, convey these uh, results in a peer-reviewed fashion um, will be um, submitted and, and released um, hopefully um, this month and then uh, certainly over the summer. Uh, and when that happens, um, our, our hope and expectation is that those are will be available to you uh, on the Myotonic website uh, so that you can uh, share these with your with your physicians. Uh, one one last question, and, and Leah, in case you have additional, but one that came in that asks, if it takes so long to get a diagnosis on average, what can be done to teach doctors and nurses what to look for earlier so that diagnoses happen earlier? Um, that's certainly a difficult uh, question. Um, and. Um... Um, I think a, a challenging one for all of us. Uh, I know the Myotonic Foundation has worked um, very diligently to um, try to um, address these gaps as best as possible. Uh, and, and many of the care considerations that are targeted at specific groups um, also deal with uh, some of the uh, kind of early detection uh, of these of um, people with myotonic dystrophy. So um, I think you know, the continued work of the Myotonic Foundation in terms of outreach is really important. Those care considerations are really uh, important. Uh, and then certainly, you know, uh, we hope that this work, which really elevates and, and increases the overall number of, uh, of people affected, will make uh, physicians think twice, well, I wonder if that is actually myotonic dystrophy, or maybe have it as top of mind uh, where it wasn't in, in the past. So though that was, that's how I would hope to address that. Thank no you. other questions from Mike. Okay, I don't have any that have come in here either. So I think that we have come to the end of the presentation, unless there's anything else you'd like to add, Dr. Johnson? No, thanks for having me and uh, thanks for allowing us to share this work. Uh, and uh, hopefully everybody is uh, staying safe and healthy during this uh, pandemic. Thank you so much for being here and sharing with us today. We appreciate it. Take good care.